On Sunday, January 22, 1984, Apple aired this now iconic commercial for its new Macintosh personal computer during the Super Bowl. After its first and only national broadcast, the company was banned from airing it again. As you watch the video, pay close attention to the images used. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives we have created for the first time in all history. A garden of pure ideology where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a contradictory force. Our unification of the walls is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people. One will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to death, and we will bury them with their own confusion. We shall prevail. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. This award-winning commercial is considered by many to be one of the greatest ever produced. It has even been credited with changing the way advertisers promote products during the Super Bowl. The 60-second spot was written and directed by Ridley Scott who was coming off the success of his 1982 futuristic film, Blade Runner. The entire ad was based on the 1949 George Orwell novel titled 1984. Like the book, it depicts a totalitarian future world of an enslaved society, devoid of individuality. They gather in an auditorium each day to hear a propaganda speech by an entity referred to as Big Brother. In the commercial, he was played by British actor David Graham. According to Apple, Big Brother was supposed to be computer giant IBM. In 1984, IBM was the fifth largest company on the Fortune 500 list. Apple wasn't even listed. During that time, IBM was so dominant that they were known worldwide as Big Blue. This was due to the company's blue logo and their strict dress code that required employees to wear blue suits with white shirts. So it's no coincidence that Apple used a blue theme for their ad as well. The premise of the commercial was that IBM wanted to lock computer users into an environment that only they controlled. In effect, it would be like living in George Orwell's version of 1984. Note the actual script from the Apple commercial. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the Information Purification Directives. We have created for the first time in all history a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of any contradictory true thoughts. Our unification of thoughts is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to death and we will bury them with their own confusion we shall prevail. So Apple portrayed Big Blue IBM as an arrogant Big Brother entity that wanted to eliminate anyone who attempted to challenge them. In other words, they would dominate the world of computers forever. The new Apple Macintosh computer promised to prevent that from happening. They used a young female athlete as the heroine who takes down Big Brother IBM. All while she was being pursued by police in riot gear. Of course, IBM didn't appreciate the reference. But that is not what got Apple in big trouble. So what was the problem? Well just take a look at these images from the 1956 movie titled 1984. It was based on the George Orwell novel and gives a nice visual of the world described in the book. When you compare the setting in the Apple computer ad, it closely resembles the film. Thus, it was seen as an obvious ripoff of the book's theme. And therein lies the problem. The George Orwell estate has very strict controls on the use of their 1984 material and everything associated with it. For example, after initially approving the 1956 movie, Sonia Orwell, widow of George Orwell, didn't care for the final version of the film and had it removed from circulation. She later refused to renew the filmmaker's license to use the story. So it's clear the Orwell estate means business. The legendary singer-songwriter David Bowie found this out when Sonia Orwell stopped him from making a musical based on the 1984 theme. For some reason, Apple never bothered getting permission to use material from the book. To make matters worse, film producer Marvin Rosenblum had purchased film rights from the estate and was planning to release his own version of the movie 1984 later that year. 
One of his concerns was that the public would mistakenly associate the Apple commercial with the movie release. It said that he was furious when he saw the ad. He then sent a cease and desist letter to Apple's ad agency. The letter emphatically stated that Apple must cease and desist immediately from further use of the commercial. It's unknown why Apple would not seek permission before releasing the video. Maybe they anticipated the free publicity that would eventually follow. Because even though they were not allowed to air it again, news outlets were showing it over and over. It's estimated that Apple received millions of dollars in free exposure long after the cease and desist letter. Since the case never went to court, it's been speculated that Apple and the George Orwell estate may have quietly reached some type of settlement. Whether Apple paid any compensation is unknown. Here are a few other interesting bits of information about the commercial. Most of the individuals in the video were actual members of the radical group known as the Skinheads. This was a very unusual casting decision, because the group was notorious for their violent behavior. So it's no surprise that there were problems keeping order on the set while filming. It was said that the Skinheads were even disrespectful to the young woman who threw the sledgehammer in the video. That woman was Anya Major. She was a young British athlete who later became a model, singer and actress. She got the role because she was the only female they auditioned who was able to handle the sledgehammer. It was also likely no coincidence that she was dressed in athletic gear since 1984 was the year of the upcoming Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles, California. It's been suggested that, since the commercial ends by saying that Apple will introduce the Macintosh in the next two days, they probably only plan to air it once. That's certainly a possibility. However, the spot was so successful that it's hard to imagine Apple not running an edited version later had it not been for the cease and desist order. And it was quite obvious that the 28-year-old Apple CEO Steve Jobs originally intended to stick with the 1984 theme. Listen to his presentation speech just a few days after the Super Bowl commercial. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers initially welcoming IBM with open arms now fear an IBM-dominated and controlled future. They are increasingly turning back to Apple as the only force that can ensure their future freedom. <laughs> IBM... <laughs> IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right? Had they not been told to stop, it's possible that Apple would have continued using the Orwell 1984 reference as long as they could. Ironically, most of Apple's executives rejected the new commercial. But since they had already paid for the Super Bowl advertising spot, they had to use it. And despite the controversy, it wound up being one of the best decisions they ever made. For the record, Apple now ranks number 3 on the Fortune 500 list. IBM has dropped to number 39. Be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Our weekly videos will feature such topics as stupid crime stories, classic TV, and the real stories behind popular songs from the past and present. There will be even more categories as we continue to grow.